So I want to introduce a, uh, I have a number of colleagues here. I'm a former Freddie Mac guy, both pre and post housing crisis. And listening to Tony talk about the transformation of, a, of the corporation and the renewed focus on affordable housing, I want to say thank you to the corporation. It's, it's impressive. You're big players, and we welcome you back to the affordable space. So thank you. With that, I want to uh, ask a former colleague of mine. She's the a re, uh, affordable lending manager out of the great state of Texas, Tamala Hartsfield, uh, to come up and say a couple of words. Let's give her a hand, please. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. It is a pleasure to be in the city of Denver. I used to live in Aurora, oh, in the 1990s, you know, back when I was 12. But I um, really love this part of the country. It is absolutely beautiful, so thank you so much for having us. And I have the distinct pleasure this afternoon of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Frank Northaft. He's the chief economist of CoreLogic, one of the largest um, repositories for information on housing, information on data analytics, and he's doing an excellent job at CoreLogic leading their economics team. He is also a former Freddie Macker, and he was um, had many, many roles at Freddie Mac, much responsibility up to and including chief economist. So we're very, uh, very proud of uh, Dr. Northath at Freddie Mac. He's also joining us um, after having many leadership roles on boards around the country. He has led many types of economic forums and housing information economic forums in the um, industry and has tremendous insight, expertise, and excellent knowledge that he's going to impart on us this afternoon. He's an excellent tennis player, by his own words, and he's also <laughs> an avid athletic um, supporter. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Frank E. Northaf to the stage. We are really going to enjoy his information. So much, well, thank you so much, Tamala. And I also want to thank Freddie Mac for being one of the co-sponsors of the Housing Summit this year. And uh, to thank Rick Padilla and the other members of the, uh, of the staff of the city for uh, the, putting on this uh, great summit and inviting me back to speak again uh, here on the, on the housing market and the mortgage market. And uh, in my remarks today, I'm going to focus on a couple of, uh, couple of topics. One is the effect of rising interest rates on the housing market and on the mortgage market. And then secondly, I want to touch a, a bit on whether or not we've seen any effect of the tax reform legislation that was enacted in December, which affects all of us, and have we seen any effects yet on the housing market. So those are the two topics I'll cover today. Uh, we'll see if my slides come back, but <laughs> they did. So, um, so interest rates have moved higher over the last year, over the last couple of years, and they're higher not only for short-term interest rates, but for mortgage rates as well. And I wanted to share some information with you to uh, uh, help all of us appreciate that the increase in interest rates has not stopped, but is likely to continue in coming months and into 2019 as well. And one of the important determinants of short-term interest rates is what the Federal Reserve does. The Federal Reserve, our central bank, pretty much determines and sets short-term interest rates. And as recently as just on March 21st, they increased short-term interest rates, specifically the federal funds target, by a quarter of a percentage point. And at that same time, they released additional data that I've summarized in this table that tells all of us what is the thinking of the members of the committee who set monetary policy. And as you can see, there are 15 members of that committee, the Federal Open Market Committee, a really select group of individuals it includes the chairman of the Fed, today that's Jay Powell, the governors who serve with him at the Federal Reserve Board, 
and the president of each of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks. So a really unique select group of monetary policy professionals. And what you can see from the slide, <laughs> from the table, is that um, the members of the committee expect the economy to continue to perform well, to continue to grow, and that the Fed should be positioned to increase short-term interest rates further in 2018. And by the end of 2018, by December 31st of this year, the members of the committee expect that the Fed will have raised short-term interest rates, the federal funds rate, another, at least another half a percentage point, maybe more. There's broad consensus among the officials on the committee that short-term interest rates are going to be going up. Where there's some disagreement is how quickly the Fed should act. But otherwise, there's pretty broad consensus that short-term interest rates will rise. And likewise, if we take a look at fixed rate mortgage rates, which are so important for the housing market, uh, what we see is that mortgage rates have started to rise. And I give you a little history here, looking back over the last 10 years. We've, we've enjoyed some really low mortgage rates the last couple of years, but that's behind us now. Mortgage rates now are at 4.6% for 30-year fixed rate mortgages from the Freddie Mac survey. And that's the highest mortgage rates have been in seven years. That's the highest they've been since the spring of 2011. And then I included the forecast, and this forecast represents the average rate forecast of, of six housing economists uh, who I, I know and trust and think they do a great job forecasting the market. It's the chief economists of the Mortgage Bankers Association, National Association of Realtors, National Association of Home Builders, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, oh, and my, my forecast too. And I took the six of them and I averaged them together and what you saw in that chart was the average forecast. And I can tell you all six of them are forecasting mortgage rates moving higher from where they are today through the end of this year and through 2019. And you can see the average has mortgage rates gradually rising and approaching and passing 5% at some point in 2019. So we're in a, which will make mortgage rates the highest we've seen in, well, gosh, uh, since the Great Recession. So we are in a market now where interest rates have already started to move up and they're not finished rising. They're going to rise further. So in that type of market, how, what, what impact should we expect to see on the housing market? Well, one that's really clear is the erosion of affordability. And let's take uh, just an example here for the, for the Denver market. So over the past year, as you know, house prices are up a lot in Denver. They're up about 8% in CoreLogic's home price index just in the last year. And in addition, mortgage rates have now moved up a percentage point approximately over the last year. So if we do a thought experiment and we consider a young family looking to buy a home, uh, let's say they, they were looking last year and now they're looking today, same exact home, let's say it's still on the market, same identical home, the only thing that's changed is house prices are up 8% in Denver over the last year, and mortgage rates are now one percentage point higher. What that means is that the monthly principal and interest payment is approximately 20% more today than it was a year ago, even if they're making the same amount of down payment. Let's say 20% down payment. So in that thought experiment, you can see the monthly principal and interest payment has jumped a lot. And for your average family, their income isn't jumping 20% per year. It'd be nice if it did, but it hasn't. And that's the crux of the erosion of affordability. And it's not just the last year. As you know, it's been something that's been happening here in the Denver market and so many other markets around the country for an extended period of time. So one effect is affordability, but I want to talk about, it furthermore, uh, another effect, a little more subtle, 
but equally important in terms of affecting affordability over time. And it's something I call owner mobility. And owner mobility may become a bit less going forward. What that means is that it's a little bit less likely that a homeowner will be putting their home on the market for sale, keeping inventory levels lean. Uh, and to examine this, what we did at CoreLogic was we used our public records database, which is the most extensive uh, public records database in the country. It covers all the uh, property deed recordations uh, all throughout um, the US. And we have it going back actually more than 40 years. But for this analysis, we took 40 years of property sales. And you can imagine the US over 40 years, that's tens of millions of home sales. And for each time a home was bought, we looked and, and observed how long the homeowner kept the home before they resold it. And then out of these tens of millions of transactions, buy and sell the same home many years later, we drew this profile. And along the horizontal axis, it's just measuring the number of years a home was, hold, was owned before it was sold by the homeowner. And on the vertical axis, we're just measuring the percent distribution out of these tens of millions of matched records. And you can see the peak of the profile uh, is about three to seven years of ownership before selling and moving on uh, again. And then we asked the question, well, what if we subdivide this population of tens of millions of records we got into a population where mortgage rates went down over uh, after the homeowner bought the home, and a second population where mortgage rates went up after the homeowner had bought the home. Would the profiles look different? And when we did that, we saw that they were different. When mortgage rates went down, which is the upper curve, it was more likely than a homeowner would choose to sell it, list their home, put it on the market, sell a little bit sooner, and perhaps trade up to a bigger home, move to another neighborhood with a better school district, whatever the reason may be. But when mortgage rates fell by one and a half percentage points, it was just a little bit more likely that the homeowner would put the home on the market and sell. And conversely, if mortgage rates went up by a point and a half, at the margin, there, was, there were a number of homeowners that said, well, you know, this home I'm in is actually OK. I don't need to move right now. You know, I'll just I'll fix it up a little bit, fix up the bathroom, the kitchen. You know, I'm just fine where I am. I don't want to pay another point and a half in mortgage interest rate. I'll keep the mortgage I have now. I'll keep the home that I have right now. And the environment that we have entered right now in the housing market is more like that lower curve. The, uh, we, we have um, uh, about half of all the homeowners who have a mortgage today have an interest rate on their mortgage of 3.5% or less. Mortgage rates today are up at 4.6%. So there's a large number of homeowners who are in that uh, lower profile. Mortgage rates have gone up. And they may have otherwise have thought about selling if mortgage rates had stayed at 3 and a quarter, 3 and a half percent, or had gone lower. But now that mortgage rates have gone up, they're going to stay put a bit longer. And if my chart comes back, oh, there it is. Uh, the, those red arrows represent the differences in the rate at which homeowners will be putting their homes on the market. What it means in practical terms is that uh, an increase of about one and a half percentage points in um, mortgage rates means that there are roughly about 100,000 less homes listed for sale per year in the United States. 
100,000 less homes listed for sale. And if you don't list a home for sale, it's not going to sell, so it translates into a decline as well in existing home sales over time relative to what they otherwise would have been. So that has important implications because, as you know, the inventory of homes available for sale in the market is really, really low. It's very, very low here in Denver. It's been low for quite some time, and it's increasingly uh, lean there's an uh, uh, acute shortage of homes in more and more markets around the US. And if we look in particular at different metros in the US and we look at inventory in terms of the month's supply of homes listed for sale in the marketplace and then relate that to the price pressures uh, that we see in the market, we see that there's a really direct relationship when inventory is very lean, very low, the month's supply is low, then it's much more likely that homes that are listed for sale will sell closer to the list price at the list price or above the list price. And that's what we're measuring, again, on that vertical axis. Uh, there are some markets where the inventory is so tight there's such a shortage of inventory for sale that on average, homes are selling above the list price. They're selling at a premium. And those are markets uh, along the Pacific Coast. But you can see Denver is not that far behind. The market here in Denver is also very, very tight, very lean supply. And that's one reason home prices are rising faster than in other markets and faster than the U.S. as a whole. Last year, Denver prices up 8% in our home price index. Um, I, I put in an arrow for Boulder as well. CoreLogic has an office in Boulder. I put in an arrow for Boulder. So you see the market's also very tight in Boulder. Prices are up a lot there too. Uh, I couldn't fit a label in for Colorado Springs and Fort Collins, but those are two of the blue dots right near Boulder. <laughs> and this morning, when Mayor Hancock spoke, and I was making references to the upcoming gubernatorial election, he said affordability is not just a neighborhood or a city problem. It's not just a Denver problem. It's a problem throughout the state of Colorado. And that's what we see in our CoreLogic data as well. It's not just Denver, it's Boulder, it's Fort Collins, it's Colorado Springs, it's throughout the state. Inventory is low, price pressures are really strong. And if we look across uh, price tiers and compare the inventory available for sale for lower priced homes, and compared with higher priced homes, we see, again, looking nationally, this is national data, but it's true also here in the Denver market, there's a particularly acute shortage of homes at the entry level price tier. And I've highlighted in that rectangle the homes that typically a first time home buyer would be looking to buy homes that are priced roughly at the median for the local market or less expensive. So that's the market that in particular we're seeing the strongest home price pressures. Home prices for um, the lower priced homes, the entry level homes here in the Denver market, they're appreciating faster than 8% over the last year because of that acute shortage and the rising demand for first time home entry level homes. And part of that rising demand for homes is coming from the really large millennial cohort. And in this chart, I've got uh, uh, data from the Census Bureau on the population in Colorado by single year of age as of 2017. And I've really focused on the millennial cohort 
And you can see the large numbers of them, especially the largest uh, part of the millennial cohort here in Colorado uh, right now are those who are aged 25, 26, 27 years of age. Some of them have been able to move out, form their own household, start renting here in Denver, here in Colorado. Many aren't able to afford even the rent and are still living with family. But over time, they will also be aging, and aging into the, first, uh, the typical age of a first-time home buyer, which today in the US is in, is in the uh, low 30s, 31, 32, 33 years of age. Now in Colorado, the uh, average age of a first-time buyer might be a little bit higher because of the affordability challenges here in Colorado between increases in home prices and now the increases in mortgage rates that have begun to happen over the last year and are expected to continue throughout this year and through 2019 as well. And, and you can imagine if we've got the lean inventory or a shortage of inventory bumping up against rising demand, Economists love to use demand supply curves. We use them all the time. I always look for an excuse to bring demand and supply into the, into the conversation. So if you got, and you, you may have heard this, how do, you, how do you train an economist? You teach a parrot to say demand and supply. So we've got this, this acute shortage of supply and this rising demand because the economy is pretty good. And because of the millennial cohort, it translates into strong price pressure and is a major reason why prices are rising rapidly in the US and here in Denver as well. And when we look at the CoreLogic Home Price Index for the US as a whole, you see the big bubble, see the crash. Prices are up 54% from the trough. Our home price index for the U.S. now is above where it was pre-recession in nominal terms. And we're forecasting the U.S. Uh, home prices to rise 6% each year going forward, in part because inventory is low, the economy is good, and there's a rising number of millennials. And if we look at our home price index for Denver, it's strikingly diff uh, different. No big bubble here like we saw in so many other markets back 12, 15 years ago. A little bit of a dip in prices because of the Great Recession, but not a big collapse in the housing market. But from the trough in the price cycle, your average home in the Denver market is up 83%, 83% since 2011. And prices, the average home price in the, in, uh, the Denver market now is almost 60% above where it was in 2006, where it was before the Great Recession hit. So the, the affordability challenges here in Denver are far more severe than we see in many other markets around the country. It's not to say that other places in the country have it easy, but it's particularly acute here in the Denver market. And I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know. You probably know, all know that already, but it's a particularly challenging uh, market to try to be a, a buyer, a buyer in, or, or to be a renter in as well, because it's not just prices going up, it's the rents that are going up as well. So does anybody benefit from higher house prices? Well, well sure, sure. Um, if, if you've already been a homeowner, if you've been a homeowner for a few years here, yeah, you, you're doing great. Because <laughs> prices are up, the value of your home is up, and it creates home equity wealth for you. And we did a calculation. We did it for the US, but we did it by state, and we did it for the Denver market. Here in Denver, just over the last year, over 12 months of 2017, the average homeowner, existing homeowner, 
primarily because of home price appreciation, saw their home equity wealth rise about $22,000, the average homeowner. Home equity wealth is just the difference in the market value of the home and the amount of mortgage debt the homeowner has on the, on the property. And because house prices rise, that drives the increase in home equity wealth. We computed it for the U.S. as a whole, about $15,000 per homeowner nationwide. Much bigger number here in Denver because of the stronger home price growth. So is, that, is anybody benefiting? Yeah, well, sure, if you're an existing homeowner, you're benefiting from uh, the home equity uh, wealth gain. Um, and in my mind, what, one of the implications that has for the mortgage market is that if you're a homeowner that has a lot of home equity wealth, oh, when mortgage rates have gone up, so the home you're in is just fine, you're happy with your 3% mortgage rate or whatever it is you got, you don't want to pay 4.6% to move now and buy another home, so you're okay with the home you're in, and by the way, You've just gained $22,000 in home equity wealth over the last year. You know, maybe it's time now to make some improvements in this home that's really just fine for your purposes. And I expect that we're going to see increases in HELOCs, home equity loans, second liens, for home improvement purposes. And I use the forecast from the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard University. They are forecasting a 7.5% increase in home improvement spending in 2018 relative to last year. Uh, and so I think that's going to drive, uh, continue to drive HELOC uh, lending and second lien lending for those homeowners who've got a lot of home equity wealth and are looking to just stay put a bit longer in this home that's basically just fine. And besides, I don't want to pay 4.6% to buy another home or to refinance. So um, I think we'll see increases in HELOC lending for home improvement purposes. Um, and that will offset the use of HELOC for other purposes. Because if you take out a HELOC in 2018, or any type of second lien in 2018, and you don't use the funds to buy a home or make a home improvement, that mortgage interest is no longer deductible because of the tax reform. It continues to be deductible on a second lien if you use the mortgage funds to buy a home, for home improvement purposes, and it's got to be substantial real home improvement in, uh, purchases. And as long as the sum of the first and the second lien is no greater than $750,000. But I'll come back to that in, the, in a couple of minutes. Um, I want to share one other thought about the mortgage market in 2018 and beyond, and how it's affected by mortgage interest rates. Each of my bars here represent total mortgage originations in the U.S. on, on homes, single-family homes. And I divided each bar into the two main components, refinance, which is the red at the top, and home purchase loans, which is the blue at the bottom. And you can see over time that red piece, the refinance piece, boy, it changes in size a whole lot on a year-to-year -year basis. It fluctuates based on the level of interest rates. The blue on the bottom, home purchase, slowly but steadily rising as home sales have improved with the recovery and as home prices have risen over time. So with mortgage rates now up by a percentage point and going higher, that refinance piece is going to continue to shrink. And our forecast is about a 30% drop in refi uh, volume in 2018 relative to 2017, but we expect home purchase lending to continue to rise as home sales increase a little bit and as home prices continue to rise as well. I want to just close and share some thoughts on um, tax reform. So the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed in December, I think it was December 22nd, had a whole bunch of impacts on the economy, 
on the market, touches every single one of us. Uh, I'm just focusing on a few things in terms of how it impacts owner-occupied housing. And you probably know some uh, all these provisions, but it lowered the maximum loan size for to be eligible for interest deductibility from a million dollars down to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I mentioned the second point: you can no longer de deduct the uh, interest uh, expense on a second mortgage that you take out today, unless it's for home purchase or home improvement purposes, and you're within the seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar cap. The third point's a big one, uh, uh, state and local income and property taxes, now capped at $10,000. Uh, so if you live in a high income tax state or you have high income, or you're in a high property tax state or happen to live in a place where house, house prices are really high, uh, you can be subject to uh, a, a big reduction in the amount of your your um, tax deductions because of the $10,000 cap. And that's why a lot of people think maybe high cost markets will be more severely impacted. But there's a fourth component that affects owner occupied housing, and that's the increase in the standard deduction, which, which basically doubled. And that is go going to reduce the number of people who itemize. And roughly like 80 to 90% of people who itemized last year took deductions for property tax, mortgage interest. Uh, most estimates are that the number of itemizers next year, when they're filing their 2018 returns, will drop by more than one half. In fact, there's some estimates that could drop 60, 70 percent, maybe more in terms of the number of people who itemize. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means those people who itemized last, this past year, and took property tax and mortgage interest deduction, they'll find the standard deductions a better deal for them. They're not going to take those deductions. So what that means, and, and who are those people where the standard deduction is better than taking the property tax and mortgage interest? They're people who, have, who uh, live in lower priced areas where they have a, a low, low loan balance, uh, places where either property values are low or tax rates are low, so they don't have a lot of property taxes. So that fourth element could actually impact uh, lower cost markets more. And so to take a look at this, was there, whether there was any uh, initial impact of the past, the discussion of the tax reform, the passage of the tax reform, or the, um, the um, um, or other impacts early here in 2018, we took a look at um, our, um, uh, one of our, our mortgage data sets to look at what's happened with sales prices. And that's the blue curve looking at what happened with sales prices through March of this year. Um, and we compared it with the average of the four, four prior years, so prior to uh, tax reform. And if tax reform had a big impact on sales prices, deflating prices of homes, we'd see that blue curve basically fall below the green curve either sometime toward the end of last year or here in early 2018. And we haven't seen any such effect. And when we looked at lower, that was high cost markets, and when we looked at lower cost markets, we also didn't see any effect either. So looking at, at home sales prices or the number of homes sold or the inventory of homes put on the market, so far, and it's still early, we haven't seen any big impact of uh, tax reform on the housing market and it may be still that it's too early and people are still trying to figure out what the tax implications of tax reform uh, will be. But so far, we haven't seen any material effect in the uh, analysis we've done. So we covered a lot of material here, talked uh, about the effect of uh, rising mortgage rates on the housing market and the mortgage market, and talked a little bit about the effect of tax reform. Be happy to take any uh, questions. Uh, anyone may have. Uh, and thanks so much for your time here today. We have time for questions? Yeah. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, I have a question about uh, in terms of the um, affordability. Do, do you see the, um, the Tax Reform um, Act, how, how, how do you think it's going to affect the LIHTC LITEC deals going forward? Because I know, you know, it seems like people are sort of trying to figure that out now. 
Well, I, you know, it's, it's still a little early to, to say, but by reducing the, um, substantially reducing the marginal tax rates for businesses, uh, the value of that credit is a little bit less than it would have been uh, previously. And by reducing the value of the, uh, the credit, uh, it makes it a, a little bit less attractive for some companies, uh, some real estate companies otherwise that might have invested into the uh, tax credits. Uh, again, it's still a little bit early, so we'll see how it plays out over time, but I see it affecting the value of it because it doesn't help in terms of the uh, reduction in the, in the tax due as much as it used to. Because the corporate tax rates at the margin came down from 35 to 21 percent. That's a big, big reduction. Hi there. Hi. I just had a question related to um, extra costs that are also um, being faced by people who are trying to enter the, the, the homeowner market, specifically related to um, health care and student loans. Yeah, and uh, healthcare and student loans are, are certainly a, a really um, uh, important and big issue, especially for some, some households, uh, especially for millennial households. The uh, student debt is uh, a much bigger burden today than it was 15 or 20 years ago. The total amount of student debt now outstanding in the U.S. is well above a trillion dollars, and uh, for many uh, young people, millennials, who are looking to transition into uh, first-time home ownership, uh, the underwriter, the mortgage underwriter, takes into account the payments that are being made on the student debt as well. Uh, and that can make it a little bit more challenging for a, a you know, young millennial uh, household to be able to qualify based on the debt-to-income guidelines that the underwriter is using. So it just adds that, that hurdle. Uh, it's not just affecting those who are looking to buy. If we looked at uh, tenants, uh, millennial tenants, a much larger proportion of them today also have student debt. So uh, in one of our other data sets we have at CoreLogic, we can look at um, ten, um, prospective tenants who are applying for apartments and take a look at um, how much, what, what share of them have student debt as well. And we see that looking back over the last 15 years or so, the per, uh, percentage of um, applicants for rental apartments who have student debt has increased dramatically. It's approximately doubled. I think it went from about 20, 25% 15, 20 years ago up to about or close to half uh, of all um, rental uh, applicants uh, today. And that can affect their ability to um, you know, uh, successfully get an apartment uh, as well. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that it may be too early to tell as to what tax reform will do to the tax, to, to light tech, uh, tax credits because I think it might also, the lower corporate tax rate might also provide greater capability among certain affordable housing developers to put more skin in the game and allow um, uh, local entities to require that as part of their management of loan funds for affordable housing projects. We're seeing that in South Florida right now. So more of a comment than a question. Okay, okay, interesting, good, good observation. Time for one last one. So we have time for one last um, comment yeah. or question. Uh, thanks for the, the great information. Um, in particular, how does your model factor, uh, factor the um, boomer downsizing, boomer move, boomers moving to retirement? and thereby creating supply, existing home supply for, for millennials, and is that gonna you know, provide relief uh, on housing price pressures? Yeah, thanks so much for that question. Uh, that's something near and dear to me since I'm a member of that baby boomer cohort. The, um, I, I mentioned how the millennials are now the biggest cohort in the U.S., that's true. But if we just look at homeowners, 
the biggest cohort of homeowners today are the baby boomers. It's not the millennials. Millennials still, for the most part, are still renting. Looking just at homeowners, baby boomers are the biggest part of the home ownership market. And the, uh, the, the leading edge, the, the, the elder statesman of the baby boom, boomer cohort, they're uh, turning 72 years of age this year. And many of them, some of them, are thinking about downsizing um, and maybe moving to, um, uh, moving to uh, uh, not only a smaller uh, qu uh, quarters, but maybe, maybe closer to downtown as well, uh, rather than remaining in uh, suburban markets. And while that is true maybe for that uh, leading edge of the baby boomers who are in their early 70s, late 60s, the biggest bunch of baby boomers are actually aged 59, 60, 61 years of age. So you remember my chart on the millennials. So the millennial uh, cohort, the leading edge of the millennial cohort is aged, uh, will be turning 37 roughly this year. But the biggest bunch of millennials are actually 25, 26, 27 years of age. Similarly for the baby boomers, the leading edge is 72, but if you look at it by a single year, year of age, the biggest number is aged right, right around 60, plus or minus a year, right around 60. And while some of them may have retired, uh, for the most part, they're still working. They put roots down in their community. They're not ready to pick up necessarily and uh, move somewhere else or downsize, especially if they happen to be living in a high cost area where they got family, kids, who are having a challenge finding an affordable place to rent, an affordable place to buy. And we are seeing that um, for um, young adults uh, aged in their 20s, a larger percent today are still living with family members rather than independently in their own apartment or home much higher percentage than we have uh, ever seen before, certainly in the last 30, 40 years. And that might be limiting the choice by baby boomers to downsize just yet. So, uh, so I, I think they will be downsizing eventually, but not yet, not much of an effect, maybe some that are uh, 71, 72 years old, but they're not the biggest part of the baby boomers. So, well, there will be some more supply coming onto the market from the baby boomer cohort. It's not going to be a big deal, and it's not going to be for uh, several years still. Thanks so much for your uh, time today. Thanks. Thanks, thanks. Okay, thanks. Thanks, thank you. Great job. Thanks. Okay, just some housekeeping items, if you will. Uh, wanna, I want to say thank you to Melissa Toddy, who led this effort with the OED staff. Yellow Chair Events, and all of our volunteers, you're, you're incredible, I think, uh, every year this, this conference. We're, we're rising the bar, Melissa, you did a tremendous job. I also wanted to let you know that you can expect a survey monkey from us. How do we make this better? What do we want to do next? Please respond to it when you get it from us. And finally, I'd like to invite you in with your name card. There's a little card in there provided by G, uh, GHC Housing PK Management for a drink at the, except, at the exhibitor and sponsor reception at 315. So please join us. Let's go to the breakout sessions and wind up the afternoon. Thank you very much.